we begin our travels through Earth's geologic history in the Hadean Aeon. This is the first and oldest of the four eons, the others being the Archean, Proterozoic, and Phanerozoic. The Hadean, named after Hades, the dread lord of the underworld in Greek mythology, spans a time from about 4.6 billion years ago to 4 billion years ago, so roughly a half billion years or so. The eon itself was formerly referred to as the rockless eon, and this is because no direct evidence, rocks or minerals or otherwise, was known from this time period. And in the last few decades, we have discovered intact rock outcrops, mineral samples of this age, all the way back to possibly 4.4 billion years ago. So nothing from the very beginning, but just a few traces of direct evidence from rocks and minerals spread out throughout the Hadean give us some indication of geologic events, but very little direct evidence exists of this time period. Most of what we know is indirectly theorized from either Earth or other places like the Moon. And the Moon has Hadean history as well, and so much of what we know from the Moon can be applied to um, Earth as well. The Hadean is informally recognized by the International Commission on Stratigraphy, the ICS. They're the people that manage the geologic timeline. But in most places, the Hadean is recognized as the first eon. During this time, we're going to find out that it was a chaotic and catastrophic time in terms of geologic events. Since the beginning of the solar system, planets forming from the solar nebula, the Earth coalesced, it started to get a geology on its surface, as did the other terrestrial planets. And then the moon was formed. And then many, many cataclysmic impacts with planetary objects peppered the surfaces of these bodies. It was a chaotic time to be on the surface of these planets. From internal energy came volcanism. And so whether the Earth was being pelted from space or having volcanic eruptions occur on its surface, it was a very lively time, and the surface of the Earth was changing all the time. So as we go through the timeline, we'll talk about geologic events, and we'll also focus on how life arose and evolved. But during the Hadean, we don't really have much to talk about, because even if life were to have existed this early in Earth's history, it would have really had a hard time, because the environment in which it would have taken place was constantly changing and really inhospitable for evolution of life. Well, cosmology is really the study of the origins of the universe. That's where we're going to begin. We're going to back it all the way out to the very beginning. In this case, historical cosmology refers to looking backward and figuring out what the origin of the universe is. And there are several different models of the evolution of the universe from its beginning to what we think will be its eventual end. And here is one such model, and it's called the Big Bang, which means that everything came from one singular point in time and space. And the universe as we know it has been expanding from this point, which is extremely dense and hot, for the past 13.8 billion years. And how do we know 13.8? How is it not 13.9 or 16 or 284? That comes from the farthest objects. We can see these things called quasars or very distant objects. And beyond that, there's other ways we can determine the time in which the Big Bang occurred. It's not directly seen, but while we can see those quasars, which are very old, we can not see the Big Bang but we can infer that it happened from various other data. Okay, so we think about 13.8 billion years ago this happened, and things progressed very quickly after that. A few hundred thousand years went by before we're starting to form the first atoms, and then a few hundred million years from getting stars and galaxies to form. In terms of stars, maybe a million years of the first stars, a few hundred million years we're getting galaxies. It's all been expanding ever since, and here we are 
the sun wasn't formed at the beginning. And so other stars have been born and exploded, gone supernova, far before the sun was actually born. Here we are in this model and everything is expanding into the future. And we'll talk about what happens to our planet and the sun over this timeline. And of course, with the universe, the timeline keeps going to the right far, far, far into the future. But for our purposes, the geology on the planet is going to end right about here. Earth's going to have a lifetime probably of about 10 billion years, which is roughly the lifetime of the sun in its current state. We think our galaxy, the Milky Way, formed between 10 and 13 billion years ago. Here we have a diagram of the Milky Way looking down on it, and it has a structure we call a barred spiral. So you can see the spiral arms where there's high concentration of stars. And then there's the core of the galaxy, which is the bar. So not a simple pinwheel, but what we call a barred spiral. We think the sun is somewhere intermediate between the edge of the outer arms and the core. And it's present between two major arms in what's called a spur. That's where the sun is right here. And that's our current estimation of the structure of the galaxy, which we think has anywhere between 200 and 400 billion stars in it at the moment. And there's different kinds of stars. Some are very young, some are very old, some are very hot and blue, and some are very cool and red, and some are yellow and just right. While the sun is what's called a G-type yellow-white star, there are other stars that are massive and burn lots of energy, and they live fast and furious lives, and they end in a spectacular supernova event. Those kind of stars end up seeding the galaxy with molecular material, which other stars can use to form and build their own planetary systems. We think that at least three quarters of all stars are not like that. They're like this. They're the little dim red stars, and uh, those are called red dwarfs. You don't really see these when you look up in the sky because they're too faint. There are a number of different types of stars, all of which could have planets. The question then is, could those planets have life? And some of these stars are better situated for the evolution of life than others. As it turns out, stars like our sun are probably the best for life because they're stable. They provide energy over long periods of time. Let's talk a little bit about the origin of the elements. We already mentioned the Big Bang and in the Big Bang event, we think that most of the universe's hydrogen was formed the simplest element of them all. After the Big Bang, maybe a few million years later, the first stars formed, and more and more stars formed and formed galaxies. These stars would evolve and then die, and if they were massive enough, they would explode and spread their material throughout the universe. Here's a picture of a concentration of old stars found in the constellation Scorpius. This is what's called a globular cluster, and these are very old stars. And typically, these kind of stars are rich in hydrogen and helium, the two simplest and most abundant elements, but they're poor in everything else. There's 92 naturally occurring elements. These stars have the first two and are deficient in the other 90. Really, the lifetime of a star is dictated by its mass. The more massive it is, the more elements it can create within its nuclear furnace in the core. And so we think that stars that are at least eight times as massive as our sun fuse hydrogen together into helium and then helium into other elements like carbon, oxygen, all the way up to iron, which is number 26 on the periodic table. This is all through nuclear fusion. And then typically after that, the star will explode and spread those 26 different elements throughout the nearby part of the galaxy where it can coalesce together and become a solar nebula for a new star. Stars that have less than eight solar masses typically don't generate all these different elements. And certainly anything 
less massive than the sun will never generate these different elements. Most of the different elements we see came from massive stars that have exploded and that material has been reincorporated into our sun and even ourselves. So much of what makes us right now came from inside a star which formed and lived and died long before the sun was ever formed. Supernova explosions are really what distributes the material from these stars, but also during these explosions you can generate elements that are higher on the periodic table, above 26. And so it's thought the combination of the internal fusion in a massive star and then its supernova event is what creates the 92 naturally occurring elements, all the way up to uranium. So this chart right here shows the evolution of different stars from very low mass stars like red dwarfs to stars like our sun to higher mass stars which have very catastrophic ends. Notice that the sun is very stable as a yellow white star. It will puff up very briefly into the red giant. Its atmosphere will expand as a planetary nebula and then it will settle down as a white dwarf for eternity. Red dwarfs, they don't change at all. They go from red to red to red, and they stay that way for a very long time, and then they don't even get the red giant phase. They don't even get a planetary nebula. They'll just settle down to white dwarf. However, the more massive stars are where the cataclysmic supernova eruptions come. And if they're very massive, they can not only produce supernova events, but also eventually turn into black holes. That is not the destiny of the sun just not enough mass. These high mass stars undergoing these supernova events are what distributes all these different elements into the surrounding space which then make it possible for other stars to form with these elements. This is an example of one such event. This is the Crab Nebula. This occurred roughly a thousand years ago and it's now expanded so that it's almost 10 light years across. A light year is the distance light travels in one year, so it's an immense distance. When we talk about these huge galactic structures, we don't talk in terms of kilometers or miles, too many zeros. A light year is one measure of distance. It's been expanding this material ever since 1054 when it was first recognized. You could actually see it as a point of light in the daytime sky. The former star was right about here. What you're seeing this material here is what used to be the atmosphere of that star and the core of that star and it is being blown out in all directions and it's also being irradiated so that you can see it through different wavelengths. So supernova events help spread this material around. Well an interstellar cloud is made up of material either that was hanging around since the Big Bang or has been generated by a supernova explosion. So the supernova material will collect and hang around and it might be affected by the local gravitational eddies of other passing stars and the movement of the galactic arms. And so you might get denser concentrations of material in one part of the cloud. In this picture here, this is called the Trifid Nebula. This is an interstellar cloud and it is a collection of gas and dust lit up by the radiation from stars within it. Okay? And the dark part of it is denser material, which is blocking the light from behind it. That's kind of what you're seeing. But that's a typical interstellar cloud called the Trifid Nebula. And most of these are composed mostly hydrogen and helium. And in, in fact, uh, in general, the composition of an interstellar cloud is mostly hydrogen, the primordial element from the Big Bang, and then helium, that's the next simplest element, and then everything else. So you can see these clouds don't really have a whole lot in them, mostly hydrogen and helium, and then oxygen, carbon, neon, etc. So then these other seven elements here, and then everything else is this tiny little dot. That's all the other elements above iron. That doesn't seem like much, but when you expand that over the volume of one of these nebulae, 
this actually is a quite an amount of material, which, when gravitationally sorted, gives you the building blocks for not only another star, but another planetary system with planets like Earth. There are other molecules in these clouds, and sometimes these clouds are called molecular clouds because the elements combine into more complex forms called molecules. Hydrogen can combine with itself. We call it molecular hydrogen, H2. Helium doesn't, doesn't need to. But we see other elements combining. And when you look at some of the most common elements like carbon, it is notorious for combining with other common elements like oxygen, CO2, or carbon monoxide, CO. But the most common element to combine with is hydrogen. And so CH4 is what we call methane. Another common molecule is hydrogen and oxygen, water. Another one is nitrogen and hydrogen, which is ammonia. So you notice that hydrogen is the commonality of all these, and hydrogen is combining with the next most abundant elements, which here would be carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Then everything else would be this slice of the pie. Basically all the other molecules that we know of are a relatively small part of the pie. But again, when you're dealing with galactic volumes and it's quite a bit of material. But relatively speaking, hydrogen, helium, they're very common, methane, ammonia, and water. So this is really what our solar system looked like before it was a solar system. This nebula here, this collection of gas elements and molecules, somehow started to contract and condense and form the solar nebula and eventually our planetary system. Oh, this is one of my favorite headers of all my slides in the semester, from shadows to planets, very dramatic. What are we talking about here? We're talking about forming a star and its planetary system from these nebula. The idea generally referred to as the nebular hypothesis, explains how we go from this vast volume of space with this elemental material into something that's more condensed in terms of a star and the planets. Here's the Trifid Nebula again. We see the lit up region, of course, but there are also some denser areas of material, which are darker, and they're pointed out as dense fragments or A, B. These are areas where there's a higher concentration of material. This shows the distances involved, and a parsec is several light years. That's another distance measurement, a parsec, so that's what PC is. So you have this cloud, what could cause it to start to contract and then to form something smaller? And we think that there are different triggers to this. One could be another star nearby exploding, going supernova, and the shock wave from that could get things moving. Everything is moving within a galaxy anyway. It's going around, and we think that there are other forces involved, galactic tides and gravity waves, and these all could exert forces on these clouds so that they're not always totally stable and they can start moving. And once they start moving, then they can start contracting. So once the contraction starts, it typically keeps going. It might reach a point of no return where there's more and more mass collected within the center of this cloud that it keeps attracting more mass and it keeps getting smaller and smaller. And as this happens, the mass starts to flatten out along a plane. So this nebular cloud starts to flatten into a disk. Now, how do we know this? One is indirectly, we can model how we think this should occur. And there's various physical laws which would govern this collapse. But we also have direct evidence of what we can see through telescopes. We see snapshots of this process occurring in different areas of our own galaxy right now. And you put those snapshots together and you get a movie. We're pretty sure this is how it goes. How long it takes is a little bit trickier. And that comes from modeling. And we think that it doesn't take very long in a geologic or galactic sense. Going from a nebulous 3D cloud to a more flattened disk maybe like from here to here a few hundred thousand years or less maybe less than a hundred thousand years into what we call a protoplanetary disk 
protoplanetary before it actually has planets in it. Most of the mass is in the center. There's a disk with mass and it's all going around the center. Everything's still falling in. We think that this itself only lasts a few hundred thousand years to maybe a few million years, maybe as much as 10 million years. The age of the sun right now is 4.6 billion years, billion. This is much shorter, a much shorter time frame than the age of the sun. So relatively speaking, this occurs very quickly, hundreds of thousands of years to a few million years. And then we start to see a protostar develop in the center of this disk. Eventually nuclear fusion will occur and that's when you get sunshine and that radiation will emanate out from the center and more or less clear all the elemental mist out of the nebular cloud. And along with that, you're getting planets forming in the disk, eventually forming into discrete bodies like the Earth and the other planets. So only a few million years to go from this nebular cloud to a nebular disk, protoplanetary disk, to a disk with a protostar. Let's talk for a second about what's going on inside the disk to form the planets. This graph right here shows the temperature distribution going from the center of the cloud, center of the protoplanetary disk, away towards its outer reaches. So you can see it's very hot in the center and it cools off at an exponential rate. So by the time you get to Earth's orbit or where Earth will eventually be, it's cooled off to just over a thousand degrees K, degrees Kelvin. So that's pretty hot. In this area is where higher temperature metals and silicate minerals will be able to condense, but the other materials, the ices and other gases, still too hot, so they remain gaseous. So as we move farther out to say where Jupiter is, we get to the point where water ice can start condensing from the cloud. So water is pretty much in the vapor form in the inner solar nebula. As you move farther out, you get more water ice. And then indeed, as you get as far out as Saturn, you start to see other ices like ammonia. So temperature is really what's dictating what molecules and compounds can condense from the nebula. So in the inner part is where we get more metals and silicate materials condensing. And as they do so, they start to form molecules and they start to form larger clusters, maybe first microns in size and then millimeters and then maybe up to a few centimeters. And as they get bigger and bigger, they have mass, they start to attract other particles. And it all begins to settle again in the spin plane of the protoplanetary disk. And as they go around the, the center of the disk, they're sweeping up other material and getting larger. These particles specifically have a name. They're called chondrules. And we know that from meteorites. There are some meteorites called carbonaceous chondrites, like this one here that was found in Mexico. It's the Allende meteorite, and it's carbonaceous. That's why it's darker. But what you see are these spherical structures in there, those are the chondrules. And looking more closely, this is a centimeter in size, you can see these are these round silicate spheres. So in the absence of gravity, as the silicate vapor condenses into spherical droplets of liquid, and then those would cool and solidify into spherical chondrules, which would come together and group together into larger form like this meteorite. So this is direct evidence. This has not been modified since the time of the solar nebula. This is the oldest known material of the solar system, these types of meteorites that have these chondrules preserved. This is the kind of material that's floating around the inner part of the solar system. Let's take another look at these carbonaceous chondrites. And here we have one. You can see the familiar look to it. Its dark color means it's carbonaceous, it's carbon rich, but also the round objects in there are chondrules. So this is a carbonaceous chondrite. What this one has is a special feature here we call a calcium aluminum inclusion. And this kind of thing has been dated 
using various isotopic techniques. And it, as it turns out, it's the oldest known solar system material. And the numbers that we get on this are over 4 billion years old, precisely 4,567 million years old. The precision on this is pretty good. Okay, and so right around 4567. It sounds like we just made that number up because it's easy to remember, but it's legit. We haven't found anything older. We haven't found anything that's 4587 or 4800 million or 5800 million. Nothing older than this. It's the oldest solid material we know of. What this represents is the material that condensed from that solar nebula, the inner part where it was fairly warm, and you had this hot vapor that's cooling off, and you started to get metals and then silicates, and the calcium and aluminum inclusions represent the first part of the cloud to start condensing into first liquid and then solidifying into these inclusions. And then the rest of the meteorite here condensed from the cloud at slightly lower temperatures, forming all the little silicate spheres, the chondrules, eventually forming a larger structure like this. And then it was, over time, collected into a larger feature, which might have been an asteroid or even something larger. This represents primordial solar system material that's still floating around out there in our solar system, and every once in a while, Earth's gravity will bring these objects down and they'll survive their passage through the atmosphere and we get to find them. This is the first direct evidence, the oldest direct evidence of the solar system and the solar nebula. Well, now we're at a point where we're starting to form solid material in the protoplanetary disk. We're going from at first microscopic scale objects, millimeters, and then larger material that we can see, macroscopic scale objects, centimeters, meters, and then kilometers. So as this material starts to form, it's circling the center of mass, which is occupied by the protostar. And some of the material is going around nice and smoothly. And in other areas, there's a lot of material buildup. And so there are gravitational instabilities and you're getting turbulence and so you're getting collection of more and more material there so it's analogous to a stream where like in the center and upper parts of a stream you have the fastest flow nice straight laminar flow because it's away from any obstructions but as you get close to the channel walls and the bottom of the channel the water is interacting more with the the sides of the channel and so you're getting the flow of the water changing its direction so you're getting more turbulence and as this happens the velocity tends to drop and in a streams case as the velocity drops you start to get deposition at first larger material like gravel and then sand and mud in the case of the protoplanetary disk you're getting collection of more and more material in these turbulent areas first smaller material and then larger material some of the larger objects have names and anything between say a kilometer and 100 kilometers in size we call a planetesimal and then if it's larger than that up to maybe a thousand kilometers in diameter we term that a protoplanet this right here is Ceres this is actually asteroid number one it was the first one discovered it's the largest asteroid and it represents a protoplanet so it was one of these early formed objects, fairly large, and it actually survived all the collisions that occurred in this early chaotic time of the solar system and survived till this day. So if we want to learn about the early solar system's history and evolution, learning about the surface geology of Ceres and its internal structure will really help that. In summary, we have the interstellar cloud and it starts to rotate for various reasons and as it does so it's going to start to shrink and as it shrinks it's going to start to spin faster and faster and then it eventually collapses down into a disk we think that takes a fairly short time maybe a few thousand years less than a hundred thousand years and this disk itself then is around for maybe a few million years 
maybe up to 10 million years. And inside that disk, we have processes going on where we're starting to form solid material for small objects and then larger objects. And then these first few million years, we're starting to form planets. So in the first few million years of the solar system, if you count four, five, six, seven as the very beginning of the condensation, the very first material, then it probably took 10 million years for the planets to form after that. So the planets formed very early, terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and then the giant outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And the terrestrial planets formed in a certain way that's a little bit different than the giant planets. We talk about that in uh, more detail in GLG 105, which is planetary science. But we have eight planets that have formed throughout this process, and we think that they were formed in the first few million years. And as they form, they're sweeping up their orbital lanes, colliding with smaller material, planetesimals, protoplanets. And every time they collide with these objects, there's a huge impact. And so we think that these impacts occurred over maybe up to 100 million years. So forming the planets occurred fairly quickly, but then these large impacts occurred for quite a while after that. Well, we've finally started to form planets, and we have eight planets in our own solar system, and half of them are what we call terrestrial or Earth-like, and the other ones are giant gas and ice giant planets. So terrestrial planets include Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. It's interesting here with our solar system, Mercury it's very small. It's almost the size of the core in the Earth. If you scooped out Earth's core, you could fit Mercury in there with ease. You could do the same with Mars. For all the bluster Mars has with its history, God of War and all that, Venus is basically the same size of the Earth, about 95% the size of the Earth. So very similar in size and mass. Whereas Mercury is not as big and neither is Mars. I also notice we've included the Moon here. The Earth is the only terrestrial planet with a moon, with a natural satellite. Mercury has none, Venus has none, and well, Mars has two pathetic little captured asteroids called Phobos and Deimos, little potato-shaped captured asteroids. Nothing like Earth's moon. All of these planets have a similar structure. We have visited each planet with spacecraft, both flyby spacecraft missions and orbiters. We haven't landed on Mercury, but we have landed on Venus and Mars. We have seismic data from, of course, the Earth and the Moon, so we have even a better picture of what's going on in the interior. We don't have that for the other planets. So the more we explore, we'll get that definition of what's going on inside, but we think they have a similar structure as the Earth, to different degrees in terms of the size of each layer, but they all have some kind of rocky or silicate lithosphere, outer layer, and a thick mantle. So a rocky lithosphere and mantle, and that's all surrounding a metallic iron-rich core. So typical terrestrial planet structure. The layers on the outside can vary, and these spheres could be atmospheres, uh, hydrospheres, cryospheres, biospheres. So Mercury really doesn't have any atmosphere or hydrosphere it, or biosphere. It does have a cryosphere. There is ice on Mercury, even though it can be very hot on the sunward side. The side that doesn't face the sun during its rotation is very cold. So there are deep impact craters in the north and southern hemispheres that Sunlight never penetrates to the bottom of these craters, so ice builds up. The same effect is seen on the moon. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere or a hydrosphere or biosphere, but it has a cryosphere. It has water ice in these deep polar craters. Venus does have a very thick atmosphere, very carbon dioxide rich. It doesn't really have a hydrosphere or a cryosphere. It is too hot. It is uniformly hot because of that thick blanket of atmosphere. A biosphere Probably not, at least in the surface. Mars, we're always on the lookout for life in a biosphere. 
We haven't found anything yet, although there's indirect evidence for it in terms of the production of methane, but is that methane inorganically produced or is it coming from life? We don't know. So we should have these answers soon from Mars, but we do know that Mars has an atmosphere. It's a very thin carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. It does have a cryosphere. There's lots of water ice, not much of a hydrosphere. There are minimal signs that there's liquid water on Mars but the atmospheric pressure is just too low for water to exist. If you opened your water bottle, that water would immediately start to vaporize. Really, it's just Earth that has an atmosphere, a hydrosphere, a cryosphere, and biosphere to go along with the lithosphere. Well, let's talk about the geologic time scale. Here is the official international chronostratigraphic chart. This is created and maintained, managed by the International Commission on Stratigraphy, the ICS. And they're the ones that are collecting the information from all over the world and putting it in one place and making sure we have an official timeline. So here it is. It goes from right now, the most recent part of geologic history. And as you go down, it gets older and older and older. We go to this column and it keeps going, going, going back in the time. And finally, this fourth column is the oldest part. So these numbers are in, in millions of years. So the beginning is around 4,600, 4,600 million. Here's the Hadean Eon itself from 4,600 to 4,000. Nice round numbers. We like that. Then the Archean Eon is this one. And then here's the Proterozoic. And this goes all the way to about 500 million years ago. Obviously, this is not the scale. So this is most of Earth's geologic history. And then lots of detail in the last half billion years. So this is all the Phanerozoic Eon, these three columns. And this is where we can break up the eons into smaller chunks we call eras. Here's the Hadean, Archean, Proterozoic. Those three eons can be lumped together into what we informally call the Precambrian. Here is the Phanerozoic, and these are made up of these eras called the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And then those eras can be broken into smaller chunks called periods. For instance, the Mesozoic has the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And those periods can be broken into smaller epochs. For example, the Cenozoic era has the Neogene period, which can be, which has the Miocene epoch, which has even smaller time periods there. As we move through the time scale, we'll be talking about these different eons, eras, periods, and epochs. For our purposes in the Hadean, it's just the eon. We don't have to worry about eras. We just don't have that precision and dating to warrant separating out different eras in the Hadean. But you'll notice the Archean has different eras in it. As we move forward into more recent time, there's a lot more material around to provide data to separate out these time periods. And there's lots of different weird names that are attached to these time periods. The numbers you'll see become more decimalized and they're odd numbers. We'll deal with all that later. But for the beginning, the numbers are nice and round from 4,600 to 4,000 is the Hadean. So that is the Hadean Archean boundary at 4,000. These numbers are all coming from various sources. There's a lot of fine print here, but basically it's been verified and scientifically tested and all that. This is the 2018 version 8 of the time scale. They're always keeping it up to date and things haven't changed too much since this was put out and so really we don't see a whole lot of change somewhere they might find better age constraints on a boundary layer and it might be a tenth of a million different or something like that but for the most part everything is settled down and these boundary ages really haven't changed a whole lot now if you go into the internet or some older textbooks things like that you might see some different age numbers for instance the boundary between the precambrian and the phanerozoic is it 541 now? Well, it used to be 542, and before that it was 545, and before that it was 570, 
Okay. And it's gotten better and more agreed upon and more precise over time. With all of this, everything is becoming tighter and it's all good. It's constantly being updated. Most of the diagrams I use in this course are geared towards this chart, but some of the diagrams that I use might use some other numbers. Don't worry about that. So this is what I'm going off of this ICS time chart that came out in 2018. Earth's geologic history, the Hadean Eon, spans a time interval from roughly 4,540 to 4,000 million years ago. So this period of time was formerly referred to as the rockless eon because the oldest rocks that we knew of as of a few decades ago were roughly 3.8, 3.9 billion years old. But we knew the earth was older for various reasons. And so that period of time older than those 3.8, 3.9 billion year rocks it was the rockless eon. And indeed, it was actually part of the Archean eon. But recently, we've split out the Hadean from the Archean. And so it's informally recognized as the fourth eon of geologic history. And in this geologic time pie, you can see the relative lengths of each eon. The longest are the Proterozoic and the Archean, uh, somewhat similar in length, as are the Hadean and Phanerozoic each being about a half billion years in length. Okay. So 4,540 million or 4.54 billion. So why is that considered the age of the earth? Well, first of all, the age is inferred from a couple things. One is certain isotopes are used to date rocks that are very old and can be used to extrapolate backwards. So they give an age that's roughly 4.54 billion. So those are from mineral samples on Earth. However, we also have data from meteorites. And as it turns out, there are roughly 70 or so different meteorites of different kinds that have been dated. And they give a consistent age range similar to the lead isotope ages from somewhat less than 4.54 to a little bit more than 4.54. One of them is the Canyon Diablo meteorite here, and this is a piece of it, and it's nicely desert varnished. It's an iron meteorite, and there are a number of different samples used to infer an age of the Earth of 4.55 billion. So these meteorites give an age range from a little bit less than 4.54 to a little bit more, okay, maybe as much as 4.58. What does that mean? Remember the calcium aluminum inclusions. Okay, they were supposed to represent the first condensation of the hot vapor of the solar nebula down into first liquid and then solidification. And they have an age of 4.567. So those may have been the first solid material to form in the solar system. And then over time, slowly, hundreds of thousands and millions of years, they would accrete into larger objects, eventually meter-sized objects, and then even larger. These meteorites are suggestive of the objects that formed after those first calcium aluminum inclusions formed. So if 4.567 is thought to be upper end of solid material forming in the solar system, then anywhere after that, the Earth could have formed. And it's thought that planets formed over a range of a million to maybe 10 million years. Somewhere in that age range, between 4.54 and maybe 4.55 or 5.6, the Earth formed. Probably somewhere around 4.54 to 4.55. But 4.54 is probably on the younger end, and that's what I use it. Earth might be a little bit older. I don't know if we'll ever know the answer to that. But 4.54 is consistent with not only ages we've gotten from mineral samples here on Earth, but also from meteorites. Once Earth formed, material is going to be moving around and sorting itself out. And this process we call 
planetary density differentiation. Most of the mass is going to settle towards the core and that's going to attract more mass. The heavier material will sink towards the middle. The lighter material will rise towards the outer parts. Heavier elements like iron and nickel and other ones will settle towards the center. They'll start to form molecules and a metallic iron rich core versus the lighter elements like silicon and oxygen and aluminum are going to be concentrated more in the outer portions of the sphere. They'll combine into molecules and so you'll get oxygen and silicon, the two most abundant of these, and then with other elements to form silicate minerals, which form most of the rocks that we see. Iron rich core surrounded by a silicate or rocky outer part, which is the mantle of the earth is mostly iron rich silicates and then the crust, which is mostly silicon and aluminum and other stuff. How long did this take? We don't know. We estimate this with modeling. It occurred maybe hundreds of thousands of years, maybe a million years or something like that. It's hard to put a precise number on it. All we know is that it started like this and had to get to this layered structure by some point. And I'll give you the reason in a minute how we know how long it took. What we do know is this is what we have now. So sometime between now and then, this had to happen. And it happened fairly soon, we think, after the planet formed. Well, why was this planetary density differentiation important? It formed the inner core and the outer core and the mantle. And in the inner core is solid iron and the outer core is liquid metallic iron and it's swirling and turbulent and it's around that inner solid ball. And as the core cools and it's releasing heat into the mantle, the Earth's magnetic field probably formed once the inner and outer core formed, which is soon after this planetary density differentiation. Not all planets have a magnetosphere, a magnetic field. Earth has a nice one. As it turns out, it is the only terrestrial planet with a decent magnetic field. You would think Venus has one like it because it's the same size as the Earth, but it doesn't. And there's reasons for that. You think Mars would have one because, well, it's Mars. It doesn't. You'd think that Mercury has one because it's got a huge metallic core. It doesn't. They have measurable but very weak magnetic fields, but nothing like Earth. But the Earth, as a terrestrial planet, is the only one with a decent magnetic field. And it's because of what's called the dynamo effect. And that's when you have this rotating planet with a liquid metallic outer core, which is convecting. And as it rotates, you're getting movement, not just from the movement of the rotation, but from the convection. And then you have electrons moving. And when you have moving electrons like that, that's an electrical current. And then that can generate a magnetic field. You can't see the magnetic field with your eyes, of course. You can see interaction of the magnetic field with charged particles and that's something on Earth we call the Aurora Borealis, for example. But for most part, it's invisible. It's not a spherical structure, but it's much larger than the Earth. And the portion away from the sun, we think, is much longer in extent. So the magnetosphere itself is shaped by what's called the solar wind, which is radiation coming off the sun. And it warps the magnetosphere into a teardrop-shaped structure so that the magnetosphere itself has a tail which points away from the sun. And there are portions of the magnetosphere which are stronger and some that are weaker. And it's been mapped out to some degree by spacecraft that have flown through it. So this is important because the magnetosphere can drain out charged particles from the sun. Something that has a charge is going to be drawn into this magnetic field and strained out. And so it serves as somewhat of a shield as protection from nasty charged particles that are coming from space. Now the atmosphere is also a nice defensive shield against particles from space as well. The combination of the two could mean an environment that is very conducive for supporting life. If Earth didn't have a magnetic field, would it have life? Hmm. It's a good question, and I don't know if we really could have the answer to that. It has an atmosphere. That helps. That's a big reason. Earth's moon, how does it fit into the timeline? 
Well, its origin has been explained a number of ways over time. There are a number of other hypotheses which try to explain how it formed, but really it took the Apollo missions, going there, gathering actual rock samples that could be dated, allowed for what's called the giant impact hypothesis to really be the one that explains its origin. In this idea, the moon formed from a giant collision between what was the Earth and a Mars-sized protoplanet. This protoplanet hit the Earth, and we think it was a glancing blow. It wasn't directly head-on. Both objects had a core and a mantle, and much of the heavier material from the planetesimal was added to the Earth, and some of the later material of the Earth's mantle and crust was blown off into space, which eventually settled into orbit around what would become the Earth. This process changed added mass to the Earth, imparted a rapid spin. Whatever the spin was to the Earth before, this impact probably set the Earth into a certain rotation and then added material into orbit, which then coalesced to form the moon. How does the Apollo missions and all that have anything to do with it? Well, for one, these ages are coming from rock samples like 4510. These are zircons that were dated from Apollo 14 samples. So the moon had to be in existence at that time. So this impact must have happened sometime before that. So it's in this age range here where we think this impact occurred. So we don't know exactly when, but we know it had to happen by 4510. Why do we think that the Earth had the layered structure before the impact? Well, this gets into the composition of the moon and some other data. And the moon has a much smaller core than it should for an object its size. And so it didn't form that way. We think that the original planetesimal hit the Earth and much of the lighter material went into orbit around the Earth. What would become the moon was made more of lighter material and less of the heavier iron-rich material, which had settled into. And so a number of lines of evidence are used to say that this impact is what created the present moon and present Earth. Okay, so this giant impact hypothesis is not without its detractors. Some say it's a very low probability event. The simple answer to that is, well, so is the lottery, but somebody's going to win the lottery. In this case, Earth won the lottery. Low probability events will occur given enough time and given enough rolls of the dice. It's important because Earth is fundamentally different from its other terrestrial comrades in that it has this natural satellite. It could be the fact that this event allowed Earth to be what it is today. It's instructive to think what Earth would be like without the moon if this had never occurred. If we just subtract some of the things that happened from this event, well, this giant impact hypothesis added mass to the Earth. So the previous Earth was less massive, and the core of the impactor was added, we think, much of it to the Earth, adding the mass. So an Earth with lower mass would mean it would have less gravity, and less gravity means it wouldn't be able to hold the gases as tightly to its surface. So it'd be a thinner atmosphere. Not only lower mass, but this impact struck the glancing blow and really set Earth off into a, a nice a once in 24 hour rotation, which is fairly rapid. And without that rapid rotation rate, your dynamo effect really doesn't develop as uh, strongly. And so the magnetic field would have been weaker uh, with a slower rotation rate. So the combination of a thinner atmosphere and a weaker magnetic field doesn't bode well for the evolution of life. Not to say life couldn't have formed eventually and existed but probably not in the same way it did. Again, it's better to have thicker atmosphere and a stronger magnetic field to a point. Now, if those are more conducive aspects for life. Not only that, but this impact created the moon, and Earth and moon are tied together gravitationally, and 
what it does for the Earth is that its rotational axis, yeah, it's, it's tilted to 23 degrees or so, but it's rotating around that axis, and it doesn't really change too much. It does various things, but it doesn't go from 23 degrees to zero or 23 degrees to over on its side to like that. It stays within a few degrees of that 23 uh, degree tilt angle. And the reason for that is the moon's out there helping to stabilize spin axis. And so only a few degrees of movement of the axis will change the amount of solar radiation coming in, hitting various parts of the planet. And that leads to a climate situation which wouldn't be stable. So your global climate would be changing all the time, adjusting to the change of the tilt axis. And that changing climate is not a conducive factor for the development of life. Not to mention, without a moon, you wouldn't have any tidal action with the oceans, and that's an important aspect of the tidal zones. As we know, the nights would be darker without moonlight. The day-night cycle would be longer because the spin rate would be slower. All these factors would contribute to a much different Earth. Would Earth be habitable? Maybe, but the chances are less likely for the same kind of habitability as we see now like Mars. But we're lucky that this wasn't the case. We did have the impact, which was a short-term kind of catastrophe for the Earth, but in the long term helped and informed the Moon in the process. The lithosphere of the Earth during the Hadean, whatever it was before the impact, we're not really sure because the impact would have vaporized much of the outer part of the earth and what it didn't vaporize it would have liquefied and so the earth's surface before the giant impact was totally destroyed once the impact occurred then there was cooling that's more or less the starting time for the solid outer part of the earth the lithosphere so since then the earth has been losing heat from within and so the heat within the Earth, trapped inside the Earth since it was formed, it's trying to get out ever since. Slowly the Earth is cooling off over billions and billions of years. And so heat flow has been steadily decreasing over time. And during the Hadean, we think it was very high. There was a tremendous amount of heat and the rate at which it was escaping the Earth was much higher than today, maybe three or four times as high. And what that really means is volcanism was much greater. Volcanism is an expression of heat flow. When you look at a volcano, that's heat coming out of the earth. So three times higher heat flow could translate into maybe three times more volcanism or at least more volcanism. So much more volcanically active planet, maybe looking like that. And that's coming from within. And then you have earth moving around its orbit, sweeping up whatever debris is around protoplanets, planetesimals, it already had a giant impact. And each time it would have one of these impacts, you'd vaporize portions of the crust. So a lot of disruption to the crust of the Earth going on. This is a model of events over the first billion years of Earth's history. Very little of this evidence for this exists because each impact would obliterate the area around it. And so it's destroying previous impact evidence. So that's why the history of the Hadean is so elusive, is because much of it was destroyed during the Hadean. And then subsequent erosion in the billions of years after that have left very little evidence for us. Well, let's take a little closer look at the lithosphere during the Hadean. When you have the ultramafic mantle and the high heat flow at the time, you're going to get melting of that mantle and it'll produce a liquid or a lava erupting at the surface that is ultramafic in composition. And by that, I mean very enriched in iron, magnesium, calcium, and lower in silica. The high eruption temperature and the lower silica content, it'll be highly fluid. It's a very special kind of lava, one that hasn't erupted since the Hadean because the heat flow has decreased over time. But this comadiite, as it's called, is very characteristic of this high heat flow time during the Hadean. Comadiate lavas would have been the dominant lava for a time, but as heat flow decreased, the percentage of melting of the mantle decreased, 
the mantle melting would have switched from more ultramafic lavas, chromatiates, to mafic lava, like basalt, which is very common. And so the oceanic crust of today is mostly made of mafic rocks like basalt. Back in the Hadean, ultramafic and mafic lavas erupting over time. The crust of the earth during the Hadean would have been largely mafic or ultramafic in composition. Comadiate and basalt would have been the dominant rock types. The continents of today are not made of these rocks. They're more felsic in composition. You have more granite and diorite and things like that. So where did the continents come from? We don't think they were originally around at the beginning. And we think that the repeated melting of first ultramafic crust and then mafic crust would, over time, yield small amounts of less iron-enriched liquid, more felsic liquid, which would then crystallize into felsic rocks, which would collect into enough volume to become continental crust. We think that this is how continental crust was generated over time. Once continental crust is made, it's, it's of lower density than the surrounding oceanic crust or mafic crust, so it tends to float on top of the mantle because it's more buoyant. And with all the activity that's going on in the surface, whether there's subduction going on or not, these new concentrations of felsic material would resist being dragged down because of their buoyancy. It's thought that once they're created, they're likely to persist at the surface and then glom on to other felsic pieces. And we think that this is the beginning of how continents are made and specifically how cratons are made. Cratons are the nuclei of any given continent. All the continents of the world today are made up of older Precambrian rocks we call the cratons. And so we think that these cratons started forming during the Hadean, and they continued to grow into the Archean. Now time to talk about the mighty Jack Hill zircons. These tiny little mineral grains found in Western Australia, the Yilgarn craton, is where the Jack Hills are, have been dated at 4,400 to 4,000 million. This is an example of one. You can see the scale here. 100 micrometers is the scale. And this is a false color image of the zircon. They're not this kind of cool blue color, but it shows the concentric growth, it's almost like tree rings. Minerals can grow much the same way. They've dated a number of these zircons, and not just dated them once, but dated different parts of each individual grain. But the whole suite of zircons gives an age span of about 400 million years. So from 4,400 is the oldest, 4,000 million is the youngest. These grains themselves are present in much younger rocks. This conglomerate here is a much younger rock and it has these pieces of much older mineral grains. The significance here is that, yes, these are very old. In fact, the oldest direct evidence of the earth that we have, oldest dated earth material. But also zircon is a mineral grain that's derived typically from a felsic or granitic source rock. What that means is the oldest zircon grains that are 4,400 must have come from a felsic rock or a granite that was at least 4,400 million years old. And from what we just talked about, to get a felsic rock, to get a granite, you need the melting and remelting and repeated melting of ultramafic and mafic rocks to give that felsic liquid. So the oceanic crust had to be there before 4,400 as well. And if we just take it one step further, that giant impact must have occurred even before that because the giant impact liquefied the whole outer part of the earth and then it cooled to form basically a shell of ultramafic and mafic lithosphere, which cooled over time and then started melting and remelting to form your granitic source rocks and your zircons. So the zircon grains, not just important because it's the oldest dated earth material, but it helps bracket when continental crust, felsic crust, felsic rock 
formation occurred, but also when the giant impact occurred. It must have been before 4400. Wait, there's more. Not only are these zircon grains important for their dating, but when we analyze their oxygen isotopes, it can tell us something about the environment in which the zircon crystals form. And so looking at the oxygen isotope ratios, we can see that these zircon grains probably formed in a lower temperature environment, one in which there may have been some interaction with surficial liquid water. Whether that would be an ocean or something like that, we really can't say. But the fact that it's a lower temperature and that the surface of the earth at the time these zircons were formed was cool enough to have liquid water which is important so the impact occurred before 4400 things cooled off probably pretty rapidly and then when these zircons were made it was cool enough to actually have liquid water all from little microscopic zircons it's kind of crazy okay so the oldest known earth materials are these zircons 4400 or so but I want a rock. I want something where you can go and bang on it with a hammer and it's an outcrop and all that. Well, we have the Acasta Nice. This is the oldest known rock outcrop, if you will. This is located in northern Canada in the Slave province here. And it's been dated just older than 4 billion years. So 4,031 million years is the oldest age estimate for the Acasta Nice. Here it is. And it's a nice looking nice, right? With its compositional banding of light and dark. This is what it looks like in outcrop. It's a neat looking rock. And it's been nicely exposed by glacial activity in the slave craton of northern Canada. So we think this nice was derived from a pre existing rock that was granitic in composition. Uh, granted, it existed sometime before 4,000 million, because that's the age of this gneiss. And at some point, this pre-existing source rock was transformed into this gneiss. We think that the pre-existing granitic source rock, or protolith, was probably about 4,200 million years old. Four billion years, that's the oldest known rock, the Acasta gneiss. Okay, we've talked about the lithosphere. Let's talk about a couple other spheres, specifically the atmosphere and hydrosphere during the Hadean. Earth's first atmosphere we call primary atmosphere, and we think that it was mostly formed from gases that were available in the protoplanetary disk around Earth when it formed. And what were these gases? Well, if you remember that graphic I showed earlier that showed the composition of an interstellar cloud and it was mostly hydrogen and helium and methane ammonia water and everything else well that's what we think the primary atmosphere is composed of it's mostly molecular hydrogen and helium methane and ammonia and probably little else remember earth at this point was less massive the atmosphere was fairly thin the giant impact hadn't occurred yet but when the impact did occur, it was a giant reset, not just for the solid surface of the planet, but for the atmosphere as well. The primary atmosphere was likely totally destroyed and blown away by that giant impact. So this early Hadean atmosphere was likely totally different in composition and nature from the later atmosphere that would form. Not only because it's compositionally different, but it's probably thinner as well because the Earth was less massive. Well, Earth's second atmosphere formed after the giant impact. We call this the secondary atmosphere. It was fundamentally different in composition than the primary atmosphere in that it was composed of not only the methane and ammonia like the earlier atmosphere, but there's now more water, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen. You notice that there's no hydrogen or helium here. so. The secondary atmosphere has a fundamentally different composition than the primary one. So where did this come from? The first atmosphere came from basically pulling in gas from the protoplanetary disk. Well, it's thought that the secondary atmosphere's origin 
came either from volcanic outgassing or from comet and asteroid impacts. And people have argued about this for decades, whether it's one or the other, and it was most likely some component of each. Volcanoes are giant tailpipes, basically. It's not just lava coming out, but a lot of gas. And the number one gas coming out of a volcano is water vapor. And then there's a lot of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. So volcanoes and volcanic activity is very dominant in the Hadean, releases a lot of gas into the atmosphere. Comets and asteroids have a lot of water and possibly other gases, we call them volatiles, incorporated in them as well. And when these objects come down and impact the Earth and they vaporize, those elements come back together and form gases. And so the impact source for these gases is possible as well. So volcanic outgassing and impact events were the likely source of our secondary atmosphere. Now, after the giant impact, things were cooling down. We just talked about the Jack Hill zircons being formed in a cooler environment where surface liquid water may have existed. And we think that could have been anywhere around about 100 million years within the time of Earth's initial formation. So that 4540 down to about 4440, any time after that, we probably had liquid water, certainly by 4400. We likely had liquid water likely that it pooled from smaller areas and you had pools and lakes and eventually oceans. One last thing to say about the atmosphere is that with Earth's added mass and its gravity after the giant impact, the secondary atmosphere was likely thicker than the primary one. And with a thicker atmosphere and one that has a higher component of carbon dioxide, methane, and other so-called greenhouse gases, the atmosphere basically can allow ultraviolet radiation in, and as the ultraviolet radiation is absorbed by the atmospheric gases, it wants to re-radiate infrared radiation back out, and then that's trapped in the gases. This is the greenhouse effect. And it's thought that this adds about 35 degrees C to the temperature of the surface. In other words, the surface temperature of the Earth would be 35 degrees colder without this greenhouse effect. That's quite a bit. In fact, without the greenhouse effect, the mean temperature on Earth would likely be below freezing, and so liquid water wouldn't exist. So the greenhouse effect has allowed temperatures to be sufficient for the presence of liquid water on a planetary scale. We think that early on in the development of the secondary atmosphere, this greenhouse effect developed and allowed liquid water to form and exist which was huge for life, which would come along later.